Back on Inside Tennessee, let's continue that part of our discussion where we were talking about turnout and then we'll dive into specific races. You wanted to make a point, Don. Yeah, you know, unlike the national scene with the Democrats, really are not very unified right now. There's a hard progressive stripe and then the moderate stripe, and they haven't been able to quite get their act together, as we've seen by trying to pre uh, pass President Biden's infrastructure plan. That's not the case in Knoxville. We have a progressive stripe of city council uh, and, and leadership, as well as a moderate stripe. And, and the Democrats have got out in unison and voted together, quite polar opposite of what's going on nationally. And I, I think that's interesting. It's, it's a testament to Matthew Shears and others to keep this Democratic Party in the fold and together, despite the, uh, the range of views that we might have within the party. Let's bring in this other map, Don. And we're talking about the districts that were up, John. We saw one, two, three, four, and six. Again, this is the city of Knoxville. And let's start in South Knoxville with District 1 and show you the breakdown there. These were the people running in that race. Tommy Smith, the incumbent, he was appointed to council. So this was really his first shot at running for a campaign. Uh, he won 57 to 43. Um, these are, of course, unofficial results. We'll see the official results certified. But, John, what did you make of how this race stood out? Uh, it stood out for several reasons. One, Tommy Smith quietly was the big spender of all of these candidates. He just kind of kept throwing it out there. Uh, we didn't really sort of realize that until uh, last week. And I was like, oh, wow, you are the big spender. We sort of thought Jim McLenaris would end up being the big spender. That was one thing that was significant. He never really, she never really made a dent into him. He was always kind of solid. And I know he was constantly out at events because I saw him at them. And he spent roughly $70,000 that we know about. At least. Which for our viewers, Susan, we've talked to you about this. It used to be you could run a, a race for city council between twenty dollars and $25,000. John making the point, $70,000 spent by Tommy Smith, the top spender that we know about so far. Uh, we'll get to it in a minute, but Lauren Ryer said she spent $20,000 in her in her race the last time and 70000 in this one. Your take on District 1. Well, I think Tommy did have more name identification because he had been appointed. He served on the city council. Elizabeth and Murphy, you know, a newcomer, um, but give her kudos for willing to put her name out there. She didn't raise a lot of money, although she did raise probably as much as a normal city council candidate would raise. Tommy just uh, got out and, and raised a ton of money and uh, used it effectively. So, yeah, that was a lot of money to spend in a city council race. Don, your take on that South Knoxville race? Yeah, I, I, I think the take applies both to the South Knoxville race and overall. Um, I usually agree with Susan on money. You really need money to win races. Uh, but I'm not sure how much money made a difference in this race. Um, I, I'm not sure that the Democrats would have fared um, any better or any worse than they did. They had a great night. Um, if they hadn't raised much money, I think you can look down at the McKenzie race and some others, but Tommy raised a lot of money. He spent a lot of money. Um, I'm not sure he needed to. I think he would have won maybe, maybe not by quite as much, but, um, uh, but kudos to people getting out there and working and doing what they needed to do to ensure their seat. Let's go to District 2. Uh, the incumbent here, Andrew Roberto, a lawyer, he was taking on Kim Smith, who's in private education. Um, and he won handily as well in the district that Susan was pointing out has really started to change dy dynamics. Used to be heavily Republican in the Sequoia Hills precinct, and that has changed. But this district in itself, John, may be one that we're seeing change. I, th I think you are seeing it change. And Andrew also worked really hard. I happen to be at a dinner and uh, he, who's in this district and who knocks on the door but Andrew Roberto, and he is campaigning. He worked really hard. How much did door knocking influence this election? Susan, from your anecdotal perspective? Uh, door knocking always helps in a race like this. When, when they were running in the district in August, it certainly makes a big difference. When you go citywide, as we did in November, it's probably a little bit less um, of, a, of a significant factor. But uh, in that district, again, Andrew Roberto raised about, I think it looks like 70,000. Kim, uh, Kim Smith raised about 20. Did it make a difference? Maybe, maybe more mailings, maybe more contact with the voters. But, you know, knocking on doors is a basic, uh, is a basic uh, way that candidates win races. Tim Burchett 
still knocks on doors running for Congress in, in a whole, you know, a whole congressional district. So, yes, absolutely knocking on doors and getting your face identified to the voter makes a big difference. Don, Susan made an important point there about mailers as well. We saw uh, uh, some real change in what was showing up in people's mailboxes in this city council race. What do you make of knocking on doors and what we saw in that direct mail? Well, Susan's right. Knocking on doors matter. I made this point uh, last week after election night. Uh, Brad Andrews would probably be our county mayor uh, had he knocked on 50 doors. Uh, he knocked on none, but knocking on doors matters. What's interesting, as Susan pointed out, when you're running citywide, you know, I wonder whether it's better to go knock on those districts that don't know you as well or stay in your home district or make sure you get that vote out. I, I suspect it's a split. The mailers, whole nother story. Again, the Herrera strategy of encouraging, you know, the ugly mailers, comparing people to hard leftist socialists, you know, a lot of this nonsense. It just isn't the case. I don't think it helped the Republicans at all. And uh, it frankly led the Democrats to expose some of these candidates with finding some pretty ugly things they had said in their past on social media. I've always said it's the devil, but uh, they got caught up in it. And, and I don't think the mailers helped the Republicans at all in this election. The mailers are, the negative mailers are the ones that you always remember, right? You don't, I mean, I got a lot of nice, warm family picture mailers. I don't remember those. I remember the, the big negative mailer that I got in my mailbox. And, right. and but one they, other but they drove the vote thing out. about those is, uh, Susan, uh, people were able to, in one of the mailers, tear off, uh, it was perforated so they could tear off and take in literally a slate of the candidates that they wanted to vote for this this particular mail had the GOP candidates on it. Yeah, and in times past, the Republican Party has run in county elections as a slate, and you would see uh, workers at the polls with a sheet that had every single Republican that was running for the county courthouse seat. That's been, I haven't seen much of that lately, but I think in this case, the Daniel Herrera led group decided that these were people that by and large had um, very little name ID. So they encouraged them to vote as a slate. And what you will find interesting as we talk through this further tonight, they all got about the same number of votes, certainly the same percentages, 43, 45, 44, 44, 42, consistent. So people did vote for them as a slate. John, we're going to come back with questions to you. We've got to take a quick break on Inside Tennessee, back with more of our analysis of this election and three more races coming up.